Hi, let's talk about lymphatic organs. In this video, we'll discuss the differences between primary and secondary lymphatic organs. We'll discuss red bone marrow, the thymus gland, and lymph nodes. We'll also discuss lymph nodules and the spleen, and we'll get into a discussion of metastasis. So there are two basic types of lymphatic organs and tissues. There are primary lymphatic organs, and these are uh, sites of uh, lymphocyte development and maturation. Uh, so we have both uh, stem cell mitosis for lymphocytes and immunocompetence, which is the process of the uh, lymphocyte maturing. These, uh, these two organs and tissues are red bone marrow, and the thymus gland. And then there are secondary lymphatic organs and tissues. Um, these are areas where immune responses are carried out. And these are going to include uh, both uh, lymph nodes and nodules, as well as the spleen. So let's discuss red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is also known as hemopoietic or hematopoietic connective tissue, or myeloid tissue. Myelo refers to marrow. And so there are two types of stem cells found in red bone marrow. There are the myeloid stem cells and the lymphoid stem cells. The myeloid stem cells are ultimately going to give rise to red blood cells, platelets, granular leukocytes, as well as monocytes and their derivatives macrophages and dendritic cells, etc. Uh, myeloid stem cells will also give rise to mast cells as well. The lymphoid stem cells give rise to lymphocytes. So these are going to include uh, T lymphocytes or T cells, natural killer cells, and B lymphocytes or B cells and their derivatives plasma cells, which are the mature B cells. Red bone marrow is abundant in the axial skeleton. So all of the, the flat bones of the skull, uh, the scapulae, the, 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 the coxal bones of the, the pelvis, the sternum, um, even the, the bodies of the vertebrae are abundant with, um, with red bone marrow. Here we can see the, uh, the head of the femur, which is in the appendicular skeleton. And we see that, um, the ends of the long bones are where the red bone marrow is stored. It's in the diaphysis or the shaft of the long bones where we see more of the, the yellow bone marrow, which is used as a place to store lipids. The thymus gland is an interesting uh, structure. Uh, the thymus is found in the, uh, in the mediastinum, specifically between the superior mediastinum and the anterior mediastinum, we can see it here. It's sort of sandwiched between the, uh, the superior anterior portion of the heart and uh, arch of the aorta and uh, superior vena cava uh, and the, uh, the anterior body wall. So the thymus is a bilobed structure. So there's both a, a, a left and a right uh, lobe to it, um, and extensions of the uh, the connective tissue that form the capsule of these lobes are then going to extend around uh, portions of thymic tissue to form uh, trabeculae or, or lobules within each lobe. And each lobe is going to, or each of these lobules is going to have uh, both a, a cortex and a medulla. So if we were to kind of section this off, we would see that the cortex is very rich in thymocytes. Thymocytes are immature uh, T cells. There's also um, a healthy amount of epithelial cells running throughout the, uh, the cortex. And then um, this is really the site of uh, immature T cell or thymocyte selection and, and maturation. And that process has two very important components to it. 
There's both positive selection, which involves making sure that the thymocyte is going to react with major histocompatibility complexes on the, the surfaces of cells, as well as negative selection, making sure that these thymocytes don't react with the body's own proteins. And so um, if, if a thymocyte fails either of these two selective regimens, uh, they go through a, a process of apoptosis or cell death. And it's estimated that about 2% of all thymocytes are going to survive that regimen. So if they do survive, the, the thymocyte continues down into the uh, medulla. The medulla is uh, a little less dense than the cortex. There are also epithelial cells and uh, more mature uh, T cells in that mix, as, as well as a, an increased presence of specialized antigen presenting cells known as dendritic cells. And it's from the medulla that the, the T cells are released from the thymus out into the uh, into the, the, the body. It's interesting because the, uh, the thymus achieves its maximum size at a, approximately puberty and then goes through a, a process of, of thymic involution or it slowly the, the, the parenchyma diminishes and is replaced by adipose connective tissue. As you can see here, these are the, the two lobes of the thymus which are largely uh, thymic fat, although some, some active parenchyma will persist into adulthood. Now moving into the, uh, the secondary uh, lymphatic um, organs, we have lymph nodes. Uh, lymph nodes are bean-shaped and typically uh, occur in clusters. Um, that, and these clusters uh, are named groups of, of lymph nodes. Uh, lymph nodes can be um, differentiated from other uh, secondary lymphatic organs, in particular uh, lymphatic nodules, because they are definitively uh, encapsulated, so they have their own, own capsule. So just deep to that capsule is a subcapsular sinus, and what happens is uh, we, we typically have several afferent lymphatic vessels coming into the, uh, the convex side of a lymph node. And so we, we can see that lymph is being transported unidirectionally. There are these specialized valves through these afferent vessels into the subcapsular sinus. Um, that Subcapsular sinus is going to feed into a cortex, which can be divided into an outer and an inner cortex. The outer cortex has uh, aggregations of lymphatic nodules, which are germinal B cells. These are, are B cells that are, are rather naive. Uh, they, they have yet to become um, immunocompetent. And these areas are surrounded by T cells. And so as, as lymph then moves from the outer cortex into the inner cortex, um, or the sinuses of the inner cortex, it's going to encounter more T cells and dendritic cells, which are specialized antigen presenting cells. From the inner cortex, um, lymph is then going to move into the medulla or the, the medullary sinuses where it will encounter more B cells and then activated B cells which are plasma cells and various macrophages. And then from there uh, lymph is going to drain from the lymph node into generally a few uh, perhaps two or even three efferent lymphatic vessels on their way along various lymphatic trunks. And so these lymph nodes represent a, an opportunity for, um, for the body to bring um, pathogens, in, in particular uh, pieces of pathogens, so they're antigens, uh, into contact with the 
uh, lymphocytes through uh, presenting them by means of antigen presenting cells such as um, dendritic cells or or uh, various macrophages. Now there are also lymphatic nodules and lymphatic nodules are different than lymph nodes in that they are without a capsule. So these are acapsular structures. Lymphatic nodules uh, typically exist as malt tissue. So malt is mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, malt. Um, and this malt may have a, a more specific uh, name depending on where it's located in the body. So for instance, um, malt around uh, the, the gut tube is known as galt or gut associated lymphoid tissue. In the larynx, it's known as lalt or larynx associated lymphoid tissue. In the, uh, the bronchial tree, it's balt or bronchus associated lymphoid tissue. Uh, and this is just uh, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue in specialized regions. In particular, we find this in the lamina propria of mucous membranes. And this malt tissue is very abundant in lymphocytes, so T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, and various antigen presenting cells. These um, these malt tissues um, are, are very important in different ways. Um, so for instance, in the gut, there are specialized Peyer's patches. So these are aggregates of lymphatic tissue in the, the distal parts of the ileum that um, are very important for uh, having a a potential immune response as uh, elements are being absorbed across the, the gut wall. Um, this malt tissue may either be diffuse, so it might be uh, sort of at a low level smattered throughout um, the mucosa, or it might be very well organized. Uh, organized uh, associated lymphatic tissues um, are known as O-malt. And a really good example of an O-malt is uh, Waldeyer's ring. Waldeyer's ring is a collection of lymphatic nodules that surround the naso and oropharynx. Um, many of these you know as tonsils. So this is a, a rather cartoonish look, but uh, if we were to divide the naso from the oropharynx, uh, this line is approximately at the level of the, uh, of the soft palate. We would see that we have the nasopharynx above the soft palate and the oropharynx below the soft palate. The oropharynx is going to be contiguous with the oral cavity. So this is going to be a, a pathway that is common for both the, uh, the respiratory and digestive systems. So this is a common aerodigestive pathway. The nasopharynx is contiguous with the nasal cavities. And so this is an important respiratory pathway. And in the, uh, the roof of the nasopharynx, we have the pharyngeal tonsil, also known as the adenoid. And we can see that here, which would be there. Uh, there are also tubal tonsils in associated with the, the openings of the pharyngotympanic tubes uh, within the nasal cavity. So on this we can see there's the torus tuberius, so they would be located right there. Um, I'm sorry, this is not the adenoid. That is the adenoid. So the adenoid and the tubal tonsils are in the uh, nasopharynx. Within the oropharynx, uh, we have the palatine tonsils, 
flanking the fossies over here. That's where the, the palatine tonsil is. If we were to look at, uh, at this particular photograph, we would see the palatine tonsils here that are rather enlarged due to inflammation uh, flanking the fossies or the, the portion of the oropharynx that's contiguous with the oral cavity. And then at the root of the tongue, we have the lingual tonsil, which we can see here in this sagittal view, uh, that is at the base of the fossies. And so this collection of lymphoid uh, tissue is known as Waldeyer's ring. And this is going to bring um, any pathogens that are either inhaled um, or ingested into contact with the lymphatic uh, system. Also as a secondary organ of uh, the lymphatic system is the spleen. The spleen exists in the left hypochondriac region, so it's just um, underneath the diaphragm in, in close contact actually with um, the diaphragm and the, the ribs behind it, as well as the left kidney and a portion of the, uh, the flexure of the colon and also the stomach. Um, the, the spleen is important because it's probably the largest single mass of uh, lymphoid tissue in the body. Um, it consists of two distinct portions of its parenchyma. There is white pulp, which is immediately adjacent to the arteries. And then there is red pulp, which surrounds the, uh, the white pulp. The white pulp is a region where we have lymphocyte action. So that's where immune responses are, are being generated. Whereas the red pulp has more of a cardiovascular function. So the red pulp serves to help uh, filter out uh, red blood cells as, as they reach the end of their lifespan. It's a place where uh, platelets are sequestered and it's also a region of uh, hemopoiesis in and of itself. So we saw before how tonsils may become inflamed and here is a, another example of inflamed palatine tonsils. Uh, this is a condition known as tonsillitis and um, generally the, the palatine tonsils are involved. We, we, we can see some purulence on the, the surface of these tonsils so they're not just large but they're, they're also um, mounting an immune response. Tonsillitis has a number of different uh, etiologies uh, most often it's, it's viral, um, but it can also be bacterial in nature. Uh, typically, if it is bacterial, it, it's a group A strep infection. Uh, in terms of supportive therapies, uh, just giving uh, it time to run its course. And only if it's a bacterial infection, um, antibiotics um, can be administered to lessen the severity. Um, sometimes if there is a particularly intransigent, uh, recurrent form of, of tonsillitis, so if this continues to, to happen to an individual or if there are issues of uh, sleep apnea, uh, a tonsillectomy or the removal of these tonsils uh, may be uh, in order. Um, sometimes this is done in conjunction with an adenoidectomy or the removal or ablation of the, uh, the pharyngeal tonsil. Uh, so palatine tonsils can be um, removed independently from the pharyngeal tonsil. In terms of uh, signs of infection, uh, the lymphatic system is, is, is something that that can be monitored and can be an early sign of, of something amiss. Um, any disease of the lymph nodes is known as lymphadenopathy. Uh, lymphadenopathy, uh, colloquially, you may have heard it as uh, swollen glands. Uh, you might have had, you know, a, a beloved uh, grandparent or, 
or parent or family friend say, you know, come here, sweetheart, your glands look swollen, and they, they start palpating. Uh, various healthcare professionals will, will palpate um, regions of the body associated with, uh, with uh, lymph nodes, uh, in, in particular, you know, around the, uh, the base of the, the neck and the, the chin and the, the temporal region and down the, uh, the lateral aspects of the neck. Um, so lymphadenopathy as a sign is extraordinarily common and very nonspecific. So it could be something very innocuous from, you know, you have a, a mild respiratory infection all the way up through something extraordinarily serious, such as, a, you know, a, a deadly malignancy or a, an extraordinarily uh, virulent and, and devastating virus. So um, it, it could be nothing or it could be everything. Generally, this is a, a presentation of some abnormality of size. So they, they may just be enlarged or consistency. So they, they may either go from their, their squishy self to, to being very firm. Uh, this can be an issue that is very generalized. So you might have lymph adenopathy over the entirety of the body or extraordinarily localized. So you, you might see that, you know, your, your submental uh, or submandibular uh, lymph nodes are, are more uh, inflamed. Uh, if there is inflammation of the lymph nodes, uh, this is known as lymphadenitis. Uh, oftentimes, lymphadenitis and lymphadenopathy are used interchangeably. Uh, this lymphadenitis is the most uh, common form of lymphadenopathy. Um, Lymphadenopathy may be um, a sign of malignancy. Um, generally, when associated with uh, a malignancy, uh, the lymph nodes are enlarged. Um, they tend to be a little more uh, firm and fixed. Uh, and curiously enough, uh, they're, they're oftentimes uh, less painful if it's a malignancy. So this might be an example of a, a lymphoma, a, you know, a, a cancer within that lymph node. Or there may be a metastasis um, into or through that, uh, that particular lymph node. And this particular individual over here, um, we can see uh, lymph adenopathy in that region of, of the neck there. There's also lymphangitis. Uh, lymphangitis, anytime we see the itis, uh, root there. That's that's inflammation, and lymphangitis is when it's uh, inflammation of the lymphatic vessels. So metastasis is the spread of a disease. So it, it moves from one part of the body to another, and there are three uh, major natural roots of metastasis. So there's transcelomic. So that's the movement of or spread of disease along a, a surface barrier or, or membrane within the body. There's also hematogenous metastasis. Hematogenous, hemato, refers to blood. So this is the spread of disease through the blood. In terms of malignancy, um, most hematogenous spread is venous, and the more frequently occurring uh, Malignancies that are spread hematogenously are sarcomas, which are malignancies of mesenchyme tissue, and renal carcinomas. There's also lymphogenous metastasis. Uh, lymphogenous metastasis is the spread of disease, uh, generally uh, a malignancy through the lymphatic system, and carcinomas Carcinomas are malignancies that originate in epithelial tissues, um, spread um, lymphogenously. Um, and you'll hear, you know, the, the, the old trope of the, the lymph nodes are, are firm, they're fixed, so they're, they're rather solid feeling. They're fixed, they don't move around, they're, they're well anchored to uh, their location, and they are enlarged. Uh, that's generally a, a, a sign 
of uh, a malignancy among lymph nodes. Although if you're palpating your your own swollen glands and, and you feel something that's firm, fixed, and enlarged, it's probably best to, to just have it evaluated by a, a physician. They, they could be that way for, for very uh, innocuous reasons as well. And that leads us to our assessment question, and that is immune responses typically occur in which part of the parenchyma of the spleen? Is it the gastric impression, the hilum, the red pulp, the renal impression, or the white pulp? Well, these impressions are just where various organs lay against the spleen, gastric against the stomach, so that's not it, renal against the kidney, and that's not it. The, uh, the hilum is the concave portion of the spleen that receives the splenic artery and gives rise to the splenic vein and also accommodates the tail of the pancreas. So that's not it. And so that leaves us with the red pulp and the white pulp. The red pulp, think red cardiovascular, is associated more with cardiovascular function. So uh, platelet sequestration, red blood cell filtering, hematopoiesis, whereas the uh, the white pulp is where immune responses are hosted. So the correct answer is E, white pulp. Thank you very much for your time.